Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am going to talk about one of my favorite tools for improving your digital life, browser extensions. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED42. All right, so to introduce the topic of browser extensions, I want you to think about what program do you use most often on your computer? What, when you first fire up your computer, when you first log in, what's the first thing that you open? It's probably your browser. Um, and that's because like so many of the things that we want to access are via websites, right? Uh, on mobile, it's a little bit different because most services that we're using have apps available um, on the desktop. It's, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit turned around. It's, websites are a much more common way to access the services that we use. So it's really important to think about how do we differentiate these browsers, right? You probably have a favorite one that you use all the time that you swear by, you think it's the best one. Why is that? There's probably a few different big differentiators that people often point to. The interface is a big one, right? If it doesn't look and feel good when you're using the browser, you're probably not going to enjoy using it. The speed of the browser, right? How fast it loads web pages, that's going to be very important as well, though it is quite often very difficult to really thoroughly test that because you can never be sure if like things are being slowed down because of your browser or because of your internet connection or whatever. Compatibility with web standards is another big one, right? If you're using a browser that doesn't support all of the features that web developers are using these days, you probably will see some weird stuff happening, right? But one aspect that a lot of people don't really talk about very often is browser extensions. What kind of add-ons are available for a particular browser? And I think that that can have a huge, huge impact on your experience with using whatever browser you enjoy using. So let's get into browser extensions a little bit. What the heck are they? Well, browser extensions are these little programs that you can install on your browser, right? They, they aren't installed like separate from your browser independently on your computer. They are pieces of code written by other people, other developers, not by the creator of the browser necessarily, and they add extra functionality to your browser. And this concept has been around for a really, really long time. If you were around back when Internet Explorer was had the biggest market share of any browser, you may remember the concept of toolbars, right? So these were pieces of software that you could install in your browser, and they would kind of take up a horizontal row. They would add extra space uh, to the interface, and they would add some functionality to the browser, right? So maybe you preferred using Yahoo search instead of Google search, because of course this is 2002 that we're talking about, and that's the kind of thing that people were debating back then. So maybe you like using Yahoo search, so you install the Yahoo toolbar onto Internet Explorer so that you can have a search bar always available right there at the top um, that searches using Yahoo. So those kinds of things can be very, very useful, but toolbars became rather unpopular because a lot of times websites or other programs would try to install toolbars into your browser without you actually really wanting them there. So, for example, maybe you're installing uh, Adobe Reader onto your computer. Nice, free software, awesome, no drawbacks, right? 
Oh, well, by the way, while you're going through the installation process, of course, there are a couple of steps where they just have like a little checkbox that's checked. And if you forget to uncheck it, then maybe the installer will also come with a McAfee antivirus that you didn't really ask for. Or maybe it comes with a toolbar for your browser that you didn't really ask for. Mm. So some people who um, maybe were a little bit less technically savvy, uh, maybe weren't paying as much attention, uh, ended up with just lots and lots of toolbars in their browsers, taking up lots of that vertical space. And so uh, browsers started to feel rather bloated, right? And, and you know, you couldn't see the web pages that you were visiting because there were so many darn toolbars installed. Nowadays, um, extensions and browser add-ons, by the way, those two phrases are pretty much equivalent. It's just that different browsers call them different things, right? If you're using Chrome, then they're called extensions. If you're using Firefox, they're called add-ons, etc. But nowadays, extensions mostly just uh, add, at, at the very most, what they're allowed to add to the interface is a little button, usually up in the upper right-hand corner of the browser window, right? And then, then that button will be your kind of window into interacting with that extension. Um, some of them don't even need that button in order to do whatever it is that they do. So those, uh, those extensions uh, can be pretty safely just like um, hidden away in the interface so that they don't show up, they don't take up any space, um, but they are still there, still running uh, on your browser. So what kinds of stuff can browser extensions do for us? Why would we install them? Um, kind of similar to when, how when you are installing an app on your phone and the app asks for permission to access various different things, like maybe there's an app that wants uh, permission to access your camera or access your location or access your contacts, right? Um, s similarly, different extensions will ask for permission to access different things within the browser. Um, it's pretty common for browser extensions to ask for permission to read data uh, on the web pages that you are visiting. Uh, and a lot of times they will also want to modify the pages that you are visiting. Why would you want to allow them to do that? Well, because that is what they're for quite often. You might have an extension that will pop up with uh, definitions of words on a page if you double click on them. That's only possible if the extension can see the words that are on the page and also modify the page by adding some code to it that will bring that definition up onto the page, right? Other types of permissions that extensions might ask for are things like your browsing history, they might ask to modify your new tab page, stuff like that. So basically if you can think of something that is in the browser, chances are there is an extension that will ask to have permission to access that particular thing. Some browser extensions work really well just on their own on, in your browser. Um, so if you've got an extension that like changes the look and feel of a website, right? Like I am very particular to having dark backgrounds with white text instead of the other way around because it's easier on my eyes. I have some extensions that will change the CSS code of some of the websites that I visit in order to have these dark backgrounds. That extension, all it does is it just runs locally on my machine. It, you know, it doesn't really need to contact any servers or anything. Other extensions are basically like they bring integrations of other services that I use directly into my browser, right? So maybe I have an extension like Pocket where I can, uh, anytime that I open up an article that looks interesting but I don't have time to read it right in this moment, I can click on that extension and it will send that, uh, that article to my Pocket account. And so then on my other devices, including my phone, tablet, other computers, right, that 
that article has been saved onto those devices. So in that case, like Pocket is definitely integrating this other service into my life directly in my browser. Another awesome thing about browser extensions is that they almost always do not require admin access, admin permissions on the computer in order to be installed. Because once the browser is installed, if you're on Windows, for example, right, you install Chrome on Windows or you get your admin to install Chrome for you. Um, But after that, like Chrome doesn't need permission from Windows, from an admin, in order to modify itself, to add code to itself. So those browser extensions can be installed just by normal computer users. And also, most browsers will allow you to like use some sort of account uh, to synchronize the the settings that you have in your browser and that includes all of the browser extensions that you have installed so when we combine those two pieces of information that we can install these on computers without admin permissions and we can synchronize them between all of the all of our devices then suddenly browser extensions become like the perfect tool for making just about any computer into a computer that you are familiar with, right? That has the customizations that you expect um, from your computers, right? So I work at SPPS, St. Paul Public Schools. St. Paul Public Schools, of course, does not trust any of the teachers with admin permissions for the computers that they use. And so when I started working here, I wasn't able to go and install all of the programs that I have on my computer at home onto my work computer here uh, at school. But all I had to do was open up Chrome, log into my Google account uh, via Chrome, and tell it to synchronize all of my settings and all of my extensions, and there you go. All of a sudden, 95% of the functionality that I use on my computer at home is available to me on my computer at school, and all of the customizations that I've made are there as well. It's also very comforting to me knowing that these tools that I'm using, these browser extensions, are available on just about any device that I might use, all the way from like the very powerful desktop that I built for myself back in college so that I could do all of my gaming, all the way to the Chromebook that I got that was, you know, a very cheap little device that I just used for taking notes in class, right? All of the same extensions can be installed on all of my devices uh, and, and run just the same. However, mobile devices, uh, so phones and tablets, right, th- those do not have extensions available for their browsers. I'm not sure exactly why that is from a technical perspective, um, but from an ecosystem perspective, most of the services that I would be using through my browser extensions uh, are available as apps on my mobile devices, so it doesn't matter quite as much, right? I don't need the Pocket extension in my browser on my phone because I have the Pocket app installed on my phone, and I can already share articles to that very easily. I can go to the app to read my articles. However, it would be really nice to be able to have other extensions like the one that I use to uh, change the backgrounds of web pages to be dark instead of light. Now, of course, not everything is sunshine and roses when it comes to browser extensions. There are some risks. Like I said before, uh, that many extensions ask for permission to read the data on the web pages that you visit. That can be a very powerful tool if the browser extension was written by somebody who does not have your best interests in mind. So it's very, very important to make sure that you trust the developers of all of the extensions that you are going to install on your browser. Um, For example, I actually got kind of caught by 
an extension that that I used to use called Stylish, and that was uh, the one that I that I used for quite a few years to change the themes of of all of the uh, websites that I visit. It was uh, sending information back to its owner's servers about all of the URLs that its users were visiting, and I'm sure that they were just using that to sell to like marketing firms or something like that. Um, they got caught and uh, removed from the stores of all of the major browsers, and so th- then I had to switch to a different one called Stylus that um, uses basically the same system, just, you know, it's hopefully made by a more trustworthy person. Brian Mitchell, another host here on the Nexus, uh, wrote in to note that he tries to install as few extensions as possible on his browser um, for issues like privacy, like what I just mentioned, um, for speed, right, and stability. Um, Because, of course, the more extensions that you have installed in your browser, the more system resources your browser is going to be using from your computer. They also sometimes can break website compatibility, right? Occasionally I will encounter a website that is behaving strangely and uh, and quite often I have to go and selectively deactivate some of my extensions that, uh, you know, mess with things on websites in order to uh, figure out what's going on and, and what I need to do to fix it. Now that we have learned what browser extensions are and kind of a top level what they can do for us, uh, I put out a call to a bunch of friends online asking people, what extensions do you use in your daily life that you can't live without? And I got a lot of responses. So we're going to go through a few of these. We're going to talk about a few of these. Um, But before I get to that, I would like to tell you about another podcast that I really, really enjoy listening to. More than 20 years ago, a war for the fate of humanity began. Wait, guys? It's combatants fought in secret. They fought in our schools. In our malls. In our amusement parks and zoos. What kind of war is fought in zoos? For all you know, for all you know, the the battle battle rages rages on on today. today. Guys, I think you're taking this too seriously. But records of this war exist if you know where to look. Records? Tales of strange blue deer with scorpion tails. Of slugs that wriggle into their victims' ears and take control of their bodies. And of the children who fought back. Every two weeks, Minds at Yerk combs through these records. You mean books written for kids seeking to glean any advantage in the war for earth's survival i don't think anyone's survival depends on listening to a podcast join the resistance by pointing your favorite podcast listening device at minds at york help Help us us turn turn back back the the invasion invasion. i'm starting to think you guys are aliens and until then and until then and until then and until then we we fight. fight I have really enjoyed listening to Minds at Yerk. I love interacting with their community, and I feel really guilty about the fact that keeping up with a fortnightly show is the only way that I can be bothered to actually keep up on reading a book series, even if it's a series that was written for middle schoolers. All right, so let's hear about some of those browser extensions that you guys wrote in about. First, an important disclaimer. Uh, I have not personally tried out most of these browser extensions, so these come with absolutely no warranty, no claim of quality on my part. These are not reviews. This is just a little forum for the community to share some uh, extension ideas with each other. All right, cool. Let's get on with it. So there are a couple of big categories that showed up right away that I noticed. Um, The first one being password managers. Several people, uh, Robin Wheeler, Hugo De La Rosa, Emma Sachs, Ryan Rampersad, Andrew Bailey, all wrote in to talk about their favorite password managers. Uh, And... If you want to hear more about password managers and which ones we here at the Nexus recommend you use, uh, you can check out second opinion number 54, which was our password managers roundup. Next big category is ad blockers. Uh, Ryan Rampersad, Emma Sachs, Chimua Lore, and David Bruitz all wrote in to talk about their favorite ad blocker. 
Uh, and this gets me thinking, you know, maybe we should do a review roundup of ad blockers since there's clearly a lot of interest in them. And I think people might be wondering, well, what makes one ad blocker better than another? So yeah, definitely write in and let us know if an ad blocking roundup would be something that you'd be interested in. Uh, If you want to learn about ad blocking in general and how that affects the media landscape, uh, you can go and check out the Extra Dimension number 11, where we take a deep dive into that topic. Grammarly is another extension that was pretty popular. Elliot Waters and Alyssa Hegerman both wrote in to talk about that. Um, Grammarly is kind of like spell check on steroids because it not only checks for spelling, but it also will check your the your grammar, your uh, writing structure, all kinds of stuff. Um, I have not personally used it. Uh, I know that it is a subscription service, I believe. So um, keep that in mind when you are going to check that out. Alyssa also wrote in to talk about Honey. Honey is an extension that will keep an eye on the uh, the pages that you are visiting. And if you are on a an e-commerce website, right, if you're shopping online, then it will find coupons for the items that you are currently looking at so that you can be sure that uh, even, you know, even if Amazon is not showing all of the coupons that are available on its page, uh, you can also, you can be sure that you're finding the best deals um, from across the web. Eric Sadoff wrote in to talk about library extension, which kind of reminds me of Honey, um, but it's for books instead. So uh, it monitors the pages that you're visiting, and if you are looking at a book that, uh, that is available at your local library, it will tell you about that. Isaac Halverson wrote in to talk about Stop the Madness, which is an extension that I had not heard about before, but looks very, very useful. Um, Stop the Madness is designed to prevent websites that you visit from kind of taking over browser interface functions, right? So some some tabs, some some websites will prevent you from using particular keyboard shortcuts or from using the right-click context menu or something like that, and uh, Stop the Madness um, prevents them from, from taking that functionality away from you. Ryan also talked about Fireshot, which is a really cool screenshot extension that allows you to take screenshots not only of the part of a page that is currently visible, but it will take a screenshot of the entire web page uh, as though you had like taken a screenshot, scrolled down a little bit, taken another screenshot, scrolled down a little bit, uh, and, and then stitched it all together. But instead of having to do all that manually, Fireshot just does all that for you right away. David Bruitz wrote in about a few that I had not heard about before. Uh, Wappalizer is an extension that will kind of tell you what kinds of technologies the websites that you're that you're visiting are using, right? So everything from like the CMS that they're uh, running on, what um, what where their servers are hosted, what kinds of analytics tools they're using, stuff like that. Custom JS for websites is an extension that allows you to inject your own custom JavaScript code into a page to give it extra functionality. And I have not personally used it, but I would imagine that you don't have to go and write all of your own JavaScript from scratch. I would, I would imagine that there's some sort of community where you can look for scripts that other people have written for it. Screencastify is an extension that will allow you to record your screen as a video. Um, So that could be very useful if, for example, you need to make a training video for work about how to edit the school website, but the school computers don't allow you to install OBS on them, and so you need to do it in, uh, in, in a browser extension. I can't imagine anybody being in a situation like that. Uh, then there's no coin, which is kind of like an ad blocker, except that it's it blocks 
websites from using your computer's resources to mine Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, which is something that I did not realize that websites do sometimes. That fascinates me. Wei wrote in about Eno by Capital One. Eno kind of reminds me of a password manager, but for your credit card number. So what it does is whenever you want to go and like buy something from a website, you can click on the Eno extension and it will give you a virtual credit card number, right? So this is a, a new number that you give to the website that you're trying to buy stuff from. And so they don't have your actual credit card number. And when they charge when they charge some money to that virtual number that you just gave them, then that gets sent to Capital One, and then Capital One charges whatever amount to your actual credit card. And so what this what the the security that this gives you is that then if there's a big breach and some hackers get a bunch of credit card numbers from like the website that you were just buying from, uh, they don't actually have your real credit card number. They have this virtual one and you can just go into the extension and tell it, okay, deactivate this number and you don't have to go and replace your actual credit card, which is nice. Mike Sandberg wrote in about a few uh, that are pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, Chrome Remote Desktop is a remote desktop platform. Um, so you install this extension on your computer. And if you have admin permissions on that particular computer, then you can set it up as a host, right? So on my desktop at home, for example, I install this extension and I go into it and I tell it, I want to be able to remotely control this computer. Uh, and then it asks for admin permissions, etc. This is one of the few extensions that I've seen that actually needs admin permissions to work. Um, and then later on, on any of my other computers, if I open up the extension, then it will allow me to remotely control my computer at home, even if I do not have admin access on the, the computer that I'm currently using, right? And I, I really like this more than other remote desktop solutions because it is available on many many more platforms than others are you know it's it's, inv it's available on my android device on all of my desktops even on the chromebook that i used to use in college pocket is uh i think i mentioned this one a little bit at the earlier in the episode but pocket allows you to save articles from across any website that you visit. Uh, you just click on the Save to Pocket button and it will send that article to your Pocket account. And then you have the Pocket app installed on all of your devices and you can read all of those articles from anywhere you are. Clip to OneNote is another extension that uh, can let you easily send, uh, send websites, send links to your OneNote collection. If you use OneNote for... Uh, as your main note-taking app, then that can be very, very useful. Scott Kopp wrote in to talk about Click2 Plugin, which is uh, an extension that helps you manage which plugins get to run on which websites and when. Calvin Rube wrote in to talk about Workona, which is an extension that allows you to kind of start start organizing your tabs in your browser as different workspaces, which is freaking amazing. I think I really need to get my mom to start using this extension uh, to help her to start organizing all of the different tabs that she always has open because I'm sure that some of them are from more of a like work context. Some of them are from a like leisure reading context. Um, some of them are from a social context, right? So um, I think this could could do a lot for reducing the clutter uh, in, in your tab bar. Christina Spinks had a couple of extensions that allow her to more effectively give to charities. Um, tab for a Cause is an extension that will put advertisements on your new tab page and uh, any money that, that Tab for a Cause makes from those advertisements 
then gets donated to a bunch of charities. Ecosia is a search engine that uh, uses the money that they make from their search engine to plant more trees in the world. And, uh, and Christina has a, an extension that uh, changes her default search engine to Ecosia. Alex Lavelle uh, wrote a short novel for me about the extension Social Fixer, which is uh, built specifically to change your experience on Facebook's website. Um, so it allows you to make a lot of a lot of changes. You can filter posts by different like uh, you can use use different keywords. Um, you can group things together in different ways. You can mark posts as red so that they don't come up in the timeline again. Um, all kinds of different tools. And uh, Alex says that this has he's he's gotten so used to using Facebook with Social Fixer on that uh, the the app is no longer usable for him because he has no control over it, right? Uh, and so Alex doesn't even use Facebook on his mobile device anymore. Uh, he pretty much exclusively uses it on a desktop with this extension in play. Andrew Bailey had a few that he talked about. Uh, U-Matrix is an extension that can block scripts, images, cookies, CSS, media, XHR, iframes, etc. on a domain and subdomain basis. So allowing you to cut down on a lot of the more complex and possibly privacy invading things that uh, websites build into themselves. HTTPS Everywhere, oh, fantastic extension made by our friends over at the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, this will force websites to give you the SSL encrypted version of uh, their websites if it is available. Foxy Proxy is uh, Andrew's VPN extension that he uses. Um, it connects him to a virtual private network, uh, which is a great tool for increasing your privacy online. Um, I think that VPNs might be another good category of apps that we could do a roundup of. So be sure to write in if that's something that interests you. And then Amplifier is a an extension that will allow you to switch between the AMP and uh, canonical version of a website, which is, oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. I think I definitely need to install that one because I, I get so annoyed when people send me links that are for the AMP version of a website and the, the URL is just all kinds of messed up and I'm viewing this little like mobilized version of a website even though I'm on a desktop. Mm, yeah, give me the, the canonical version, please. Amusingly, both Brian Mitchell and Ryan Rampersad wrote in to tell me about the React DevTools extension, which um, is definitely something that you will only use if you develop using the React framework of JavaScript. And finally, uh, I had uh, a few that nobody else mentioned uh, that I use on a daily basis. Um, Stylus is the extension that I use to uh, customize the style of the websites that I visit, in particular, making them have a dark background with light text. Uh, and then Pushbullet is another one that I use. This integrates, helps me to integrate all of my different devices and make them feel like one cohesive whole um, because I can uh, easily like push links or files from one device to another. And, and I'm not just talking about like from one desktop to another. I'm also talking about my mobile devices. And the really, really cool thing is that it can also uh, take all of the notifications that I get on my phone and uh, mirror those on my desktop or my laptop, right? So even if my phone is across the room charging, uh, I can see all of my notifications popping up on my screen on my desktop. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so if you want to use any part of this episode, feel free to, as long as you link back to the original page, which again is thenexus.tv slash TED42. 
If you have some other browser extensions that we didn't mention in this uh, in this episode, or if you want to discuss any of those extensions that were talked about with other listeners, please head on over to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you're willing and able to help support us financially as we continue to make educational tech-focused content here on the Nexus TV, uh, you can head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Until next time, have a good one. <laughs>